a really, really warm welcome to all of you. So um, it's, it, this is a, a piece of work that our, our collaborators uh, from the IFRC Psychosocial Center and from REPC and APC um, will, be, uh, will, will be presenting on. And this is, what, this is really interesting and, uh, and, and useful material. So, um, so just, just to get started, um, many of you would have seen the information on the, on the um, registration page and form. But just, uh, just to recap, you know, the, the toolkit that we're, we're unboxing today uh, is called a Hopeful, Healthy, and Happy Living and Learning Toolkit. And it was developed by REPC uh, and its sister organization, APC, and uh, the IFRC Reference Center for Psychosocial Support, um, the PS Center for short. Uh, and this is a process that has been supported by uh, MHPSS.net and was very kindly funded by uh, Education Cannot Wait. And the toolkit um, is basically a set of materials directed towards um, children, parents, uh, and caregivers, and also teachers uh, in, in a variety of settings, um, which aim to promote psychosocial well-being and, and, and link um, up to key life skills to um, strengthen social and emotional learning. And, and this was something that was very much uh, intended for use um, and, the, and the, the, you know, the, the momentum for this came due to the, the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the, the needs that we were seeing from, from communities and, and schools around the world. But, um, but in some ways, uh, the, the way that it has been designed, uh, because we didn't know at the time also when we would be out of this, how long it would last, it's lasted perhaps longer than we anticipated, but, but the toolkit has been designed to be relevant to, to basically any sort of crisis or emergency. And um, we have the three um, authors uh, of the respective um, components of the toolkit, uh, Jonathan uh, Morgan, Ea Akasha, and, and Mark Duclo. Uh, and, and we also, I'd just like to say that we're really um, grateful for the support of, of colleagues uh, from both the MHPSS world and the EIE world, and some of those who, who work in both, as well as um, teachers and parents who've, who've kind of, you, tried out some of the drafts and, and, and reviewed them for us. And I'm hoping that some of um, them are present in the room today um, uh, or, or will be joining us shortly, right? Um, so in terms of the, the toolkit and what we're gonna be talking about today, um, there are three components. Um, they're the guide for teachers um, that AIR um, uh, uh, led on, the parent and caregiver guide that was developed by Jonathan, and the activity guide that, that Mark uh, is the author of, right? And without any further ado, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna um, go from starting with Air, then to, um, then to Jonathan and then Mark. Each of them is gonna take a little, um, take over the screen and, and share with you um, something about the toolkit, what it is meant to do and how it can be used. And then after each of them speaks, we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to ask them questions. We do have just the hour, so um, it's gonna be about 15 minutes per tool, but um, don't worry, this is just the first encounter with the tools where we, at the end of this, we'll tell you about how we can continue this conversation uh, going forward. Okay, so I am going to just hand over now to Air um, to talk about uh, the guide for teachers. Thank you very much. And uh, nice to see so many known faces and some unknown faces. I'm Ian Susanna Kasha. I'm a technical advisor from the Reference Center for Psychosocial Support of IFRC. And um, I want to talk about the toolkit for teachers. But first of all, I'd like you to grab a pencil or a pen so that you have that ready for when we're going to try out one of the exercises later on. A pencil is better, but that's because it's um, organic material than a pencil, but a pencil will do. And um, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to say is that this toolkit is named for teachers, but actually can be used for all working with youth and children. So it could be for educators, people um, who are sports coaches or work in clubs, youth clubs, or they are child and youth organizers. So the tools are for children to learn and, and students to learn about um, a lot of social skills. And um, I wanted to say a bit about that because the COVID-19 pandemic is not only a health emergency that is uh, all across the world. And the reason why we started this work, it's also a pandemic of 
loneliness. And let me give you a few interesting facts. Um, one of the things that student counselors most often meet when students come to counsel in, 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 in high schools and in, in, in education is loneliness. People actually, students actually come and say they're lonely and it's embarrassing for them to say that they're lonely. We know that one, four out of 10 in the UK in general would say that they're lonely. Um, there's been a rather big university study in several countries that come out with the result that of those under 30, 24.5% say that they're lonely. They feel lonely. Um, and um, there's even in universities in America been classes for university students where they learn how to work in groups, how to read others and how to be social because these skills are lacking. And, and one thing that is actually bringing us all together like the social media, our phones, smartphones, et cetera, is also bringing us apart. And loneliness is one of the things that take us apart from each other. And what we also know is that the digital abuse to children and, and young people have increased dramatically during COVID-19. Um, it is actually um, bullying and abuse has moved from the school where it used to be a lot to into the digital space. And we know that people are more affected mental, their mental health is more affected badly in a bad way, negative way um, by this kind of abuse. So um, what we need to teach is all these skills, cognitive skills, social skills, and the emotional skills um, for our youngsters and young people, the children, students, to be very good at um, having friends, you know, keeping friends, being friends, being a good friend. Um, and, and during pandemic, we know how important friendship is for, for students. And um, there was a research in, in Denmark where I'm based, where um, students was, was asked during Corona, and 90% said that they missed their friends. 70% said that they missed their school as well. So we know how important friends and peers are for young people. So um, the, the things that we're doing in the teacher's guide um, is actually not only learning people these skills, but they will stimulate, and I didn't put that in the manual, but they will stimulate what happens when we meet friends. They will uh, have our body and, and brain react in positive ways so that we will have um, a lot of um, dopamine release. We will also have oxytocin, which is the feel good connectedness hormone uh, and brain um, signal um, a substance. Mirror neurons, when I meet a friend and, and, and the friend smiles and I smile back, you know, we have this interaction and, and we feel good. So um, we also have serotonin, um, especially when we are in, in a surrounding where we are respected and feel appreciated. And finally, we also have, um, it lifts the mood, by the way. So um, I'd say that all these things that come out of learning and, and working with the exercises in the manual is, um, is are very good tools for young people to learn, to socialize, to make friends, to keep friends, to be good citizens. And um, I should say that loneliness is also about, it's also a political thing. This is why we should act, advocate for, being for there being spaces also where young people can socialize and children can socialize and learn to be together. Now back to the manual. So the manual has got um, introduction. I'm gonna do an exercise with you from the introduction briefly. And then I'm just gonna mention some of the themes um, and they're all, they look very individually oriented, but they're not because they're in a group um, setting. So it's like my school after Corona, I know about feelings, I help others, I understand others, I listen to others, I listen to myself, I can, uh, I can be assertive, no, that's it comes next, I can calm myself, we have, I can be assertive, um, I can solve conflicts, I can cope with change. I know about gender. Yes, I can say no. And we have the grateful, hopeful, uh, I can move, I can relax themes. 
and, and this is why we call it um, the, the Hopeful, Healthy and Happy Living and Learning Toolkit, because it's actual skills that we take that are transferable, as uh, UN says, that we can use them in, in our daily life. So um, let's go on to one of the pencil exercises. I've taken two exercises to do with you that, um, that are, is from the theme three that's called I Help Others. So I want you to, no, this is from the introduction, then there's one from, from theme three. So I want you to take the pencil, one hand, and then with the other hand, you're just gonna trace the contours of your hand. And whilst you do that, this is one of the calming exercises. What can you do to calm yourself when you are too excited, you can't learn? So very often children need to calm themselves. We're getting into the parasympathicus, the parasympathic nervous system, and we are awakening the senses, go down to the wrist, to the palm, and do the back. As you can hear, I'm sighing because I have this and my speech is now becoming slower because I'm more relaxed. So in a class, you do both hands. We're here. I'm just going to do one. And I'm just going to ask you to notice how it feels. You can stop tracing your hand. Even if it feels good, you want to continue, but Notice how the hand feels, how you get in touch with the sensorial experience of you, of your hand. So that's one of the calming exercises. There's a set of calming exercises and also you can also do movement exercises in the manual as well. I'm just gonna now take you through team three, um, the introduction which is I help others. And first of all, um, the class will do an exercise where they, first of all, and you can do the same, they think about um, ways that they helped, um, they helped somebody yesterday or they were kind to somebody. It can be by making way when we, they were walking back and forth from school or they helped somebody at home or in their environment. And, and after, teacher has taken a few responses, the, the class will then talk about um, how they can help each other and make a big list of how they can help each other in class. So that's one way they, they, they work with, um, I, I help others. And um, at the end, there's a summary for the teacher to say that when we help others, it's actually makes us feel better. So that's part of helping others. And next, there's a series of exercises that the teacher can do, and I'm going to ask you to do one of them. And I'm going to tweak it a bit to fit the what I talked about for before loneliness, because um, they do one of the exercises that are complete the sentence. Um, it's um, it's helping other is, and then there's several ways that you can do it, where you take a round ball throw, and everybody says, for instance, I ask for help when I. And I would like you to think about when you feel lonely. I, when you're lonely, who do you ask for help? So, so just complete the sentence in your own mind and think about, because we all feel lonely sometimes. We may not be lonely, but, but we can feel it. But who do, you, who do you then contact? Who do you reach out to? So say to yourself, when I'm lonely, I reach out to and see what comes to mind. And that's actually, that's the end of my 10 minutes. My friends, great, Meng, thank you. I do the same, yeah. I was just having friends in mind. Anybody else? My wife, oh, that's lovely, Taras. Happy for you. My sister, good. My husband, I go visit my mother, my cat, my pet, friends as well, my grandma. Oh, that's beautiful. Right. My kiddos. Yeah, <laughs> I do that too. My best. My team. Oh, thanks for keeping, for, for having 
my siblings, my plants. Oh, that's a new one. That's very inspirational for all of us. Um, I have to, I have to end. My time is up. So I will encourage you to look at the manual. You're unmuted. This always happens. Thank you so yeah. much, Air. Thank you for the um, for the, the the exercises that give us just a, a tiny flavor of all the really useful things that are inside this manual. So I really encourage you to to check it out. I have time for one question to Air. If anyone has a burning question that they'd like to ask her now, we we will hopefully have some time on the end. But I can't guarantee. It. I want to make sure that we hear about each of these great <laughs> tools in turn. Um, so does, would anyone like have a question to ask Ea about the toolkit? Uh, if not, I am going to then, uh, yes. Um, there's a question from Luca saying, were children involved in the ideation? Yeah, actually, um, thanks a lot for these questions about the, the children's involvement and, and for all ages. And actually, there's one thing um, we didn't put ages, um, age groups in the manual. And that was because children are quite different um, in different parts of the world because of the school system being so different. So um, a child in one country of 11 may compare to somebody who's 14 in another country. So it's all at the, at the teacher's discretion and children has been involved. Um, and actually the um, thing is that um, a lot of the exercises are some that I've used in many countries where I've worked and now I just packaged them differently and, and, and invented new ones and, and was inspired by others. So they have been used. Um, we've been doing um, child resili children's resilience program in Pakistan, um, different places, Lebanon, Syria, jo Jordan, um, quite a number of places around the world. So thanks for the questions. Thanks so much, uh, Air. Um, I know that there are more questions coming in the chat. Air, I would like to ask if you might be able to respond to them in the chat as we move forward. Uh, I think one of the interesting things, just to pick up on one of the questions asked, is that um, is around the development of these tools. And I think uh, many uh, we've been fortunate that that the three authors have um, long histories of work and uh, of of implementation of development of. Uh, of, of similar, and they've drawn from that in addition to the consultation rounds that we had, uh, both both that they did and that we did collectively. Um, so in some ways, you know, um, you know, we were talking about giving credit to where these things come from, and they and they come from all of us. They come from you know, twenty years, 25, 30 years of of work uh, in different settings. So that that also brings the. <laughs> richness. Um, I'd just like to then perhaps um, I just I'm going to share my screen very quickly so I can show you the cover of the next um, book we're going to talk about, which is uh, is, is the uh, parent and caregiver guide that Jonathan um, uh, developed. And I'm going to just hand over to Jonathan now um, to, to explain uh, what's inside. Jonathan, you're muted still. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan from Cape Town. Um, thanks very much for joining this unboxing ceremony. And uh, I'm going to talk you through the uh, second tool in the toolkit, which is the Hopeful, Healthy, and Happy Living Learn Kit, which is the Parent Caregiver Guide. And uh, this one is a little different in its presentation. It's a glimpse into the lives of six families around the world during the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's a kind of a storybook. It's, uh, you could call it case studies, but um, one way that we think it can be used is that you can almost use it as a children's book that um, along with children, and obviously um, it would need some adaptation and some retelling, but uh, you can look at the case study, you can tell the story to the child and you can ask them for their response and you can build on key messages which are embedded in the case study. So, um, I just want to just uh, stick with the cover a little bit. You can see the six families. The one is in a, um, uh, an IDC camp in Syria. And um, I think they're called the Ahmed family. There's a, a family in India. 
there's a family in Russia, there's a family in Africa, in uh, South Africa, there's a family in China, and uh, there's a family in the UK, in London. And um, uh, each one of these families, they are profiled uh, with a specific theme in mind, and uh, that's a psychosocial mental health uh, theme. And um, so, for example, the Ben family who are in London, I'll show you a picture which depicts them a little bit later, but uh, the, what, the main message they're bringing uh, to this um, case study and to this uh, communication is the importance of structure. So as we know that uh, in the time of COVID, uh, the household can be very chaotic and crowded and frustrating and the external environment can also be very uncertain. So uh, the importance of structure is emphasized and uh, the families encouraged what the Ben family do. And they, are there, by the way, in response to one of the earlier questions, they have a child with special needs and uh, they develop a daily structure, a weekly schedule, uh, which brings a structure into their lives. It's got things like one-on-one uh, -on -one emotional time. It's got things like play, it's got free time, it's got school study and those kind of things. And in a very participatory way, the children are, um, the children are invited to develop the this, this schedule so that they can take ownership of it. And uh, so I'm just giving you a glimpse into the different um, families. Uh, the next family is the Naidu Kala household and they're in Calcutta, India. And uh, the main theme of their, this case study or vignette is promoting pro-social behavior rather than negative discipline. So you can imagine <clears throat> that uh, in the time of COVID, in a, um, in a very crowded, uh, chaotic household, uh, there's a lot of frustration and parents may be tempted to exercise like um, negative discipline, even corporal punishment to just to keep things in check. And uh, what this uh, case study uh, points to is, is uh, promoting pro-social behavior encouraging the kind of um, psychosocial behaviors that you want to see rather than punishing the negative ones. And uh, it also looks at conflict resolution and um, also learning through play. So, um, you know, for instance, using pots and pans and uh, counting potatoes, for instance, as a math lesson and uh, that kind of a thing. Um, the next- Jonathan, um, Could I just yeah. jump in? Jonathan, are you, are you sharing your screen right now? I'm I am sharing my screen, but maybe you're not. Seeing I'm it. not seeing it. We're not seeing it. We really. Um, would you like to just try that again? All right. So I'm just trying to see how to do that. Um, I'm going to go. Uh, hold on a sec. Um, the, the the green button on the where you see. Share screen. Call. Okay, and um, share screen, but I'm not seeing the. It might be down at the bottom. You have to scroll down till you see the, the screen you want to show us. No, I'm terribly sorry, people. I'm not seeing, I'm not, I'm, I'm looking at a whole lot of screen options, but if I go to desktop one, let's see. Uh, desktop one and I'll go. That, um, so we can see your desktop now, Jonathan. Um, can you I'll see? see what just, can, yes, now we can see uh, the, we can see the, the uh, table of contents. Table of contents. That's the one we want right, to see. Perfect. Thanks. Over to you. All right. So you, you, weren't, you weren't missing on very much because I was not looking at specific pages in the guide. I was looking at the table of contents, but this will help you stay focused. So the, the next one is the, um, where was I? Um, the the pro-social one I think I'd spoken about. And the second one is the, the third one is the internally displaced people camps and COVID-19. And you meet the Ahmed family in the Northeast Syria. And uh, this looks at psychosocial issues in an IDP camp. Now, as you can imagine, the issues in an IDP camp are, might be similar to a family living in London, but more pronounced, more intense because of the overcrowding and the difficult conditions in an IDP camp. So um, this case study really, really looks at um, uh, these issues, which we can look at a little bit later, but sticking with the overview, um, the fourth family is the Bengu family in Durban, South Africa, 
And uh, the theme that they bring to the table is talking about corona and loss. So um, many children might be terrified. They, they hear that corona is a life-threatening illness. They're scared that their caregivers might die. It's quite a heavy theme. So they're dealing with loss and the fear of death. Some of them have lost, uh, may have lost people. And, uh, but uh, this family is also looking at supporting remote learning and um, uh, multiple intelligence. So uh, it's important that the caregiver and the parent recognizes that children are different and they, they look at the many ways that children can be clever and uh, opportunities for praising and supporting children who are clever in different ways. Um, the next family is the Ivanov family in Moscow, Russia. And uh, the theme they deal with is sharing chores, dealing with stigma and prioritizing self-care. And um, so for instance, the, uh, the father who's Dimitri, who's a single father, uh, he uh, struggles to keep the apartment uh, clean and tidy. So he makes it into a fun game and he puts on music and people dance, the children dance and sing while they clean. Uh, but he also deals with a slightly heavier issue of stigma. Uh, the family have been stigmatized. They told that their mother died because of COVID and they're the COVID family. And uh, they look at their experience, but also their solutions around dealing with stigma. And uh, Dimitri reaches out to teachers and other parents for support. And he also needs respite from care and he gets a neighbor to kind of babysit in inverted commas to child mind his children and he goes out for a run. And uh, then um, the Chen family uh, in Beijing, China, um, uh, the theme they address is tips to protect your children online. So because uh, of the need to spend more time online uh, during COVID, especially for education, um, uh, he looks at uh, some of the risks involved and some of the tips that can be shared to protect children online. And um, there's a section on family harmony, um, the importance of uh, being good role models for the children and uh, keeping harmony in the family. And at the very end, there's a reflection and checklist. So the caregivers can check how's their household doing along all these thematic areas and do a rapid assessment and see if there's room for improvement or they're doing fantastically or um, not doing very well at all and uh, can sort of prompt them in the right direction for improvement. And uh, I said earlier that this uh, could be used as a storybook for children, but then uh, there's even a section on supporting children to make their own family COVID-19 hero books based on the Repsi and Epsi um, uh, tool of making a hero book where you look at a psychosocial issue that is standing between you and your goals. And you look at ways that you can, the tricks and tactics and strategies you might have to overcome those goals. So in this case, the psychosocial issue might be very specific like stigma, or it could be frustration of staying at home and uh, in a small apartment or a small house. And uh, the hero book, is a family COVID hero book. So that is just a very quick overview from the table of contents uh, of this booklet. Yeah, and, Jonathan, uh, would you, would, I'm just noting the time. I'm just would like to invite you to maybe to try and use a little bit of the question time to share um, something from within the book. That's right. So I, I'm just going to uh, flip you through the book. So there's nice illustrations for the children. This is the Ivanov family who. I said dancing and cleaning and singing at the same time. And uh, here's an illustration of the family in India who are using uh, uh, learning, uh, to, uh, to playing, play and learning, combining it. And um, the Ben family make their schedule. And uh, there's something about emphasizing washing of hands. So you can see it's kind of a child-friendly uh, format. Uh, there's the Ben family in London with their child with special needs and one-on-one um, -on -one time uh, with parents uh, separating children and spending time together with them. And uh, this is a, 
the, the, the family in India who attempted to use corporal punishment, but will promote pro-social behavior. So I won't go through every illustration, but it will give you the idea of some of the layout and some of the uh, messages that are in the book. So I think I'll pause there and uh, for any questions uh, in the chat, or um, I'm not sure exactly how you're going to ask me questions, but I'm ready to answer them. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'd just like to invite, actually, if just in the interest of time, anyone who'd like to um, ask a question to just uh, unmute uh, themselves, maybe put your hand up, and I can call on you um, to, uh, to ask a question directly to Jonathan. Anything about how this could be used, uh, adapted the process of development? Sorry, I'm, 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 I see I'm screen sharing and I'm not seeing the chat. So, um, let so me see. You, uh, why don't you stop screen sharing, Jonathan, if you press that. Uh, okay, there we go. Now I can see the chats, yes. Uh, we've also just posted the link. Uh, our colleague Alok has been posting the links. App. As soon as someone presents a resource, we've posted the link that should take you directly to that resource. And, that, and at the end, we'll share a page that has all the resources on them as well. Um, but perhaps- yeah, Amanda, thank, thank, thank you for that as well. Just want to encourage the, the, the presenters uh, to, to answer the questions that are coming directly from the chat box as well and can type while uh, others are presenting too. So like AI is doing, thank you, Aya. And I see Vanessa has the, the hands raised in here. Over to you, Ananda. Well, over to Vanessa. Vanessa, please unmute. Uh, and, and ask your question. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I have a quick question. Is, uh, does the parent need training or any kind of support to use this book? Or um, is it just um, yeah, easy to, to use for parents? Or what, what sort of training or what sort of um, support would they need? Yeah, that's a really good Good question. Um, I, I, th I think it was designed that uh, the parent can read this first by themselves or perhaps with other caregivers in the household and prepare themselves uh, for working with children who the who really the target group. So I don't think they need training, but they probably need some kind of preparation for themselves after reading it and deciding, yes, stigma is a big issue for us. Uh, positive discipline is a good big issue for us and then they will choose how to begin to message that uh, for the children. Thanks very much. Um, we have next uh, hand raised by Vongesh. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, but please do unmute and ask your question. Thank you, um, Jonathan. My question, I think, is related to also Vanessa's and I guess your response. Um, in our experience as well, Vision, we work with um, very vulnerable households as well to a point where parents are illiterate and may not understand very dense um, uh, information. So I guess topping up from Vanessa's question around, um, you know, parental uh, parenting trainings, um, can there be or is there a simplified version that's not really tech heavy that uh, parents who cannot read or write can follow? Or is there a plan to have trainings that can help parents better have, you know, practical skills on, on the stuff that you have um, included in the handbook? A uh, good question. Unfortunately, there's not a simpler version. Uh, this was uh, designed, um, so it wasn't a very text heavy uh, version. It, uh, it has uh, short case studies, it has uh, quick uh, short takeaway messages, but um, of course it's going to be even too dense and text heavy for certain uh, groups who may be, um, you know, illiterate, or I don't know if that's the politically correct term, but who have difficulty or limited reading and writing skills. Um, 
then I think it would be up to implementing organizations to run workshops around this and to simplify it further. But this is kind of as far as we got. Thanks very much for that, Jonathan. Um, great, I'm going to actually just look at the time. I'm gonna perhaps move on um, and, uh, and uh, take, us, take us over to, to look at the, the final tool. We'll, we'll have time once everyone's had a chance to look at all of them and hear from each of the authors to, um, to uh, uh, take some more general questions. Uh, with all three authors in the round, but but just over to uh, to um, Mark right now uh, to talk about the activity guide for teachers, parents, and children. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Ananda, um, and thanks everybody for joining us today and for the opportunity to share uh, the work that we've been involved in. Thanks to Ia and Jonathan. Uh, we've worked together as a team, uh, together with um, lots of other people putting this material together and it's been a really enjoyable process um, and there's been a lot of a lot of uh, thought and um, uh, a lot of effort that's gone into the uh, to the production and so I think you could have you will have seen that with the first two products already my name is Mark Luca I'm a consultant psychologist uh, and I work extensively with APSI and REPSI um, and I uh, really believe that the work that they're doing is amazing in the region around psychosocial support. The product that I developed <coughs> is basically um, an, an activity guide, which I think was intended mainly to run alongside uh, of the two products that you've heard about already. Um, in other words, to support them. And um, the activity guide uh, was um, designed around, let me share a screen here with you quickly. Um, was designed around social and emotional uh, uh, learning uh, uh, domains. Uh, we, we probably, everybody on this call probably grew up doing life skills programs in your schools, what used to be called life skills. And many of you probably in your careers have, have uh, facilitated life skills programs. <clears throat> what you will have recognized if you follow this field is that we don't really use the term life skills anymore. Uh, it's become a little bit obsolete, um, which I'm okay with because I think it was a term that was vague and, and overused. And mostly what we talk now, about now is social and emotional learning, cell. And I think you're going to see in the next uh, couple of years that the field will move qualitatively and quantitatively towards adopting this as a term for what we used to broadly call life skills. And there's a lot of good work being done uh, in, the, in the arena of social and emotional learning going way back to the establishment of CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning coming out of the University of Illinois. They were kind of like the progenitors of this term, um, but it's really been taken <clears throat> on board and there's been some extremely good, elegant research that's been done uh, to show that uh, when children, school going children, are exposed to uh, well-developed social and emotional learning programs, uh, that it dramatically improves their well-being and their academic functioning. Um, and so it's appropriate that we are using social and emotional learning in a product that um, is ostensibly designed to be used um, in schools. One of the things that this research has shown unequivocally is that when children's uh, social and emotional well-being is intact, um, their academic grades go up. Now, that's a major step in the right direction because we used to separate those of you that have been in the field for a while. You know that we used to separate out social and emotional learning or life skills and have a separate class for that, right? And depending on the school, that class was often canceled and replaced with extra math lessons. Uh, the whole life skills curriculum that was introduced into schools um, really never took off. What we now know that research is showing unequivocally is that when we infuse social and emotional learning into the main curriculum of schools, into, into every classroom and into every subject, um, the, the, not only do children enjoy school more, um, they learn incredibly important skills for life, um, but they also do better academically. So just a quick bit of ad advertisement for social emotional learning. But you'll see on your screen that uh, the domain areas that I have developed this material around uh, are the main domain areas that you will find in most uh, literature around social emotional learning. It starts with self-awareness, of course, that's where it all starts. Understanding self, 
And once we have a good understanding of self, our emotions, and how we interact with ourselves, our intrapersonal and interpersonal well-being, then we move to self-management, which is, I know a lot about myself now. I know my strengths. I know my challenges. I know how to control my emotion. Now I move to self-management, which is how to control my emotions, how to control uh, my cognitions and uh, my and my my functioning as a person. And then we move into social awareness, which is who am I? Who am I within the context of my social settings? Um, how do I uh, read other people's emotions? How do I interact with people in meaningful pro-social ways? And you can start to see why this is so critical in today in the 21st century. Um, and then that moves naturally, it sequences and increments into relationship skills. Once I have a good understanding of who I am within the context of my social settings, whether that's a classroom, a home environment, a sport team, I can then use that, that knowledge um, to engage meaningful, meaningfully in pro-social ways um, in, with relationships. And then all four of those, when they are, uh, when they are intact and when um, children have a good level of self-awareness and they have self-management skills, they have good social awareness and they have good relationship skills, the outcome of that for young people is that they are far better able to make wise decisions um, and control impulses and be good decision makers about uh, who they want to be and what they want to do and how they are going to be healthy and happy and hopeful in this life. So um, without going into a lot of detail about how this relates to COVID, because cell has been around for a long time before COVID, and, and frankly, so has our awareness that ch children and adolescent uh, mental well-being has been on a precipitous dive um, for a decade now. Um, World Health Organization have classified adolescent depression as being one of the number one global health challenges. Suicide rates were skyrocketing before COVID. So um, although this material, all three of these products are written um, uh, specifically for the COVID era, um, of course, these um, will continue to be useful after COVID and uh, will, would, would have been useful prior to COVID. So, th so that's where it's, it's developed. It's developed around those five areas and it has a table of contents right at the beginning which makes it really easy for a facilitator, whether that's a parent, a caregiver, a teacher, a youth group leader, um, any, as Ia said, any uh, individual who facilitates programming with children can use this material. Um, but we did specifically focus in on the home environment because of the amount of remote learning that's taking place at the moment. Um, and so we know that there are millions of children all over the world that are being taught in the home environment. Sometimes it's a sibling group. Sometimes little cell groups are put together here in Zimbabwe. Uh, we work hard to uh, get children into uh, social contact with other children in small cell groups because our schools have been closed for a long time. So each of the activities um, is outlined and you will see it here. The first one is um, section one is self-awareness, going back to the, the, the original domain uh, those domains and so there is 10 or so activities that focus specifically on self-awareness you can see from the titles i am me if i were uh, feelings of friends like um, the mirror game and so this is all about how to get to know self better it was aristotle that said the beginning of knowledge is knowledge of self so this idea that it starts with understanding yourself uh, each uh, on the table of contents you can see the age group is outlined so, and the amount of time that it will take for you to do the activity. So if you're a facilitator, you can do one of two things. You can, if you're with your group for an extended period of time, you can use this as a set uh, curriculum and start with the activity one and work all the way through to activity 40 or 42, I think. Um, but it does not have to be sequenced. It wasn't written and necessarily intended to be sequenced and incremented. I think it will work better if it is sequenced and incremented as you go through self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, social management, but it doesn't have to work that way. Each one of these activities is standalone. So you can, you can uh, scroll through this and you can make a decision. Okay, I think I want to do this one. Um, the $86,400 question. Uh, it's for 12 to 18 year olds. Uh, here it is here. And then what is it for? To help children understand the importance of effective time management. 
And this activity is all based around the fact that there are 86,400 um, seconds in the day. And what are you going to do? Because you can't carry that, time, that money over the next day. Once this time is gone, it's gone. You can't put that time in the bank. And it's designed to help children understand that uh, to seize the moment and to uh, manage their time well because um, they can't put that 86,400 seconds in the bank. It's gone at the end of the day. So you can go through your table and pick out the activity that you want. Um, and then when you get down to the actual, I'm going to use my finger here, this is going too slowly. Then when you get to the actual activities, you will see that they're really intuitively laid out. We had some great people working on layout and, 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 and the uh, diagrams. And they did an amazing job. They took our rough, rough work and, and, and wove their magic into it, and it really looks good. So here's the first activity. <clears throat> what I want to do, though, is take you down to um, an activity right at the end. Um, it's on page 69, so I'm just going to do this. Sorry if this is giving you an epileptic fix. So, right, yeah. So here, you, this is an activity called Stranded on a Desert Island. Um, and prior to that, the, the activity is uh, Stranded in the Desert. So the Stranded in the Desert is for 12 to 18 year olds. And you'll see that it's really nicely laid out. What is the aim of the activity? Here it is here. To introduce young people to an effective system for making wise choices. It should take you 120 minutes. It's for 12 to 18 year olds. Participants requires a group of six or more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Each of the activities we have outlined whether this activity can be done in a home environment with one or two children or whether it's best done with a big group. A lot of the activities can be adapted to be used in the home environment because we know that a lot of parents are still doing home based teaching, um, but most of them are for a group um, uh, and designed to be used in a classroom setting or in a home cell group where you've got maybe seven or 10 children together. Um, you know, Social and emotional learning does work best in a social setting. Um, and that social setting can be a family, but there are challenges to that. And if I've got time, I'll tell you a little bit about some of those challenges uh, doing so in the home environment. But then um, there then, then is a list of the materials. You'll need copies of the Lost in the Desert handout and a poster or drawing of the STEP system. And all of the handouts are really nicely outlined in the appendix. And you can go to those and copy them um, for use in each of these, these activities. And this activity is really fun. I've done this one hundreds of times um, with teenagers and with adults going right up to uh, big corporations. Um, and it's, it's a great activity. And basically, the, it's a scenario-based activity. Remember experiential learning, which is what these are. These are not games. Um, and so don't call them games. It is fun, but they're not games. They're experiential learning activities. And that, that's a different approach. An experiential learning activity always has an opportunity for you to transfer knowledge and skills that have been gleaned from the activity into real life. So that's the difference. That's the essence of an experiential learning activity. You take a novel setting and you say, let's pretend we're lost in the desert. And let's pretend that we've only got 12 objects that we need uh, that we can take with us um, as we try and head back to, to um, the safety of the uh, town, which is 200 miles away. Um, how would you make the decision about which 12 objects you will keep? And that's what this activity is. It gives them a list um, of, of all of the uh, stuff that is in the bus that broke down. And then the group have to sit and they've got to grade it. The most important item all the way down to the least important. Um, so it's a decision making activity. And then at the end of the activity, um, each of the activities has um, uh, facilitation tips, questions to ask, comments to make, um, and some teaching as well. So, for example, in this one, what I've done is I've included the step process at the end, which is a decision-making uh, process, which is uh, S-T-E-P. Say it out loud, what's the problem? T, think about your options. Um, e, explore the consequences of each option. P, pick one, and then S, step out and take it. So each of the activities... Is, is firmly rooted in the science of experiential learning. And every one of these activities are fun and they do play games together, but at the end, there is always the opportunity for you to say, how are you gonna use this when you get back into real life? When you get back into the classroom, when you're facing a, a, a serious peer pressure challenge, where uh, you have to make a decision whether to do something or not, uh, whether you have to make a big decision about leaving school or a small decision about whether to go and play with a friend or not, um, here's an 
a really good system for you to do it, um, which will help you to make a wise decision. So that's just one of the activities. Um, and, and here's one that's graded for a younger age. This is for 8 to 12-year-olds. And then the last one is four to seven year olds, um, which is, um, uh, of course, a lot, a lot simpler. This one is just about um, two donkeys that um, find some hay and they've got to try and decide um, how they're going to uh, get to both um, piles of grass and how, uh, if they decide to work together, they can eat both piles of grass. So um, each activity is, is structured around the age group from a pedagogical perspective. Um, and are very simple to, to follow. So that's it in a nutshell. I heard one, somebody once say, if anything can fit in a nutshell, it deserves to be there. But uh, this is the nutshell of what we're doing. Um, please take a look at, the active, uh, look at this guide. Um, I think you will find there are some, some real, really great activities in here um, that can really help young people during these very trying days um, to think more about who they are to think about uh, who they want to be, to think who they, about who they are in a social setting. And, and that's how we came up with the term of healthy, happy, hopeful, living and learning, um, because that's what the goal is. Um, health, mental health, um, happiness, very broad, vague term, but we know what it means, and hopeful. Lots of young people feeling hopeless today. So these activities are all built around building health, hopefulness and happiness um, in today's children. So I hope you use them and I hope you enjoy using them. Um, I've used most of these, uh, all of them actually, and they're great. So good luck in using them. And uh, any questions on the material? Let me stop sharing there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, mm -hmm. It's really, really helpful and, and lovely to see, um, see them, of course. Um, we have a couple of questions um, around, there's one around uh, whether, there's any special training that might be required for teachers to use these in classrooms, um, similar to the ones that were asked also of, yeah, earlier. I'm, I'm glad that question has been asked because frankly, I think that does need to happen. If, if there was any follow-up from this program, these three products that have been developed, um, if I could wave a magic wand, it would be that we would develop a facilitator guide. Um, that's not to say that a parent can't use this material and it's not to say that a teacher can't use this material. But what I have found having been in this field for over 20 years, is that just a few succinct, helpful tips for facilitators on how to work with children and adolescents from a psychological perspective can really help. And I'll give you a very quick example. When I did the external review of this material, I sent it out to a number of people, parents, caregivers, and teachers. And then we had a, a session together, and, and under you helped us put this together, and Mario. Uh, and we got questions, and, and there's, a, there's a program here called I Wish I Were, which is uh, around um, uh, self-awareness and it's designed for children to think about who they want to become and what they want to do with their life and the parents um, read, did the activity with the child but she wasn't happy with who the child imagined they wanted to be when they grew up because that's the parent's job right to say uh, are you sure you want to be an astronaut that's a bit silly you know we live in Zimbabwe and there's no space program here and um, I think of something more realistic um, and she said the whole program just fell apart. And so the idea behind the facilitator training is to help, for example, for parents. And by the way, there is a section in this guide um, giving helpful tips for parents. But um, it's really important to just let your children share their thoughts and their feelings without judging them and without being prescriptive and showing empathy. Wow, that's amazing that you want to be an astronaut. Where did that come from? I did not know that. Uh, is that something you've always wanted to do? That would be awesome if you could do that, um, as opposed to, don't be silly, you could never be an astronaut. So parents tend to be very prescriptive um, because they are in protection mode and they don't want their children to be disappointed and don't aim too high because you'll, you'll you know. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but yes, we do. You can use this material, but you've got to use it carefully, especially if you're a parent, that you're not overly prescriptive. Um, Teachers are much better at this, of course, and um, <clears throat> professional program officers should know how to do this. But I would love for us to develop a facilitator's guide, particularly for this activity guide, a short guide that um, just gives a, a key tips on how to interact with young people, particularly 21st century young people. This generation now, they don't like really being told what to do. They don't, they don't like advice. 
what they do want is to be given an opportunity for their voice to be heard and for them to express what their wishes are and for um, the adults in the room to be able to support them in that and be empathic as opposed to uh, judgmental, uh, critical, or um, prescriptive. And so I would love to see I'd love to see a, a facilitator's guide come up, but you don't you can do it without it. Thank you, Mark. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. I'd like to give Ea and Jonathan a last word, if you might, in terms of a, a message that you'd like to share with uh, uh, colleagues here today uh, about the use of the tools. Um, and then I, I will have a quick couple of words wrapping up to, to talk about where we can continue this conversation. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Okay, I'm really happy to hear and see all the engagement from from all of you out there in, in working with communities. And I love that. And when it comes to facilitation, I think that when you look at some of the tools, you will find that there is actually um, there's actually some description of, of, of how you can do it. And when we look at all the manuals, each and every manual that we have for anything, there's always a lot of pages on, on how to, to, to do it. And I sometimes find that it becomes rather repetitive. So I think that, that if we teach people some general skills, like Marcus just talking about how to communicate with young people, um, then it, it makes things um, go really smoothly. So that was it from my side. Thank you. And Jonathan, last word from the authors. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, um, you know, I'd like to respond. To, there was a question about how we recommend that we use the parent caregiver guide. And I've already said that the parent or caregiver should read it first. Take, don't rush, read through it, read the case studies, and then uh, engage with the children uh, it, it, almost like as a storybook or as a section of stories which won't be told in one night as a bedtime story. You take your time, you can address all these, these psychosocial issues over um, a period of time. But uh, REPSI has a, a methodology called the Journey of Life series, where they use picture codes for low literacy populations. And uh, this, this is really a short step from what this guide is to a Journey of Life kind of approach, where you look at the picture, you have some discussion about what people see in the picture, where it applies to their own and how they think they could address the issues that are raised in the picture. So I'd be really curious whether people can actually use this uh, with lower literacy populations and uh, maybe in another chapter and in another universe we could develop a solution guide around that. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm just going to wrap up. I'm just keeping eye on the time, we've got about a minute and a half left, um, just to say um, that we can continue this conversation uh, at the at the new um, community of practice that was established on MHPSS.net around MHPSS uh, 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 and education emergencies. Um, and uh, I've just posted the, the link to that in this. You do have to be a member of MHPSS.net for that, but we will also be sharing content from that outside. We have a forum section and there is a new thread on this um, on this toolkit. Um, so if you have questions, you can post them there, observations uh, and so on, and we can exchange some of that there. Um, I just want to, since, since this is a, a, a great opportunity uh, and, and uh, to, to share with you just one more thing coming out of this, the same initiative, um, which, um, you know, you can have, um, you can't launch a number of toolkits all at once, but one of the things in parallel with the, 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 the these three um, these three resources that have been developed was a compilation of a much larger kind of compendium of MHPSS and EIE materials, uh, particularly focusing on the intersection between them, trying to see how how the two fields can can be aware of and utilize um, resources that that's that uh, that span that their areas of concern and so very soon we'll be releasing um, this uh, which will be both online and PDF a, a, a compendium of, of, of different forms of uh, guidance toolkits training resources packages etc including this which will have um, 
uh, of course, include uh, these brand new ones as well. So just uh, to say, we just pop a, a, an exit survey in the link so you can tell us a little bit about how useful or not or um, and what you liked about this, this session today and, and any challenges you might have had with it, please do take that um, so that we know what to do following up. But please, and, and I'd just like to end with thanking uh, the authors for the time and thanking especially all of you for your questions and for your interest um, today, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, th thanks very much. And we'll hopefully continue this conversation in the community of practice, uh, but also perhaps in, in uh, further sessions like this um, once everyone's had a chance to use them. And we've already had some comments in the chat, some private messages about people looking at ways in which they might actually apply this. So it's really exciting to see that. Thank you. Thank you.